Chapter 6 Integrated Propulsion System Technologies ERA researchers pursued several technologies for improving aircraft jet engine performance in ways that would simultaneously reduce fuel burn, noise, and emissions to meet national objectives. Project goals for fuel burn called for an immediate reduction of 33% relative to optimum performance standards as of 2005, and of at least 50% by the year 2020. Within these same timeframes, researchers hope to reduce NOx emissions by 60% and 75%, respectively, relative to SEEP-6 standards. Goals for noise reduction were based on effective perceived noise levels measured in decibels, IPMI, a measure of the relative loudness on an individual aircraft during a 10-second duration pass-by event. In the immediate, researchers strove to reduce aircraft noise footprints by 32 IPB relative to FAA Stage 4 requirements, and by 42 IPB by 2020.1 working in collaboration with Pratt & Whitney, General Electric, and the FAA, GRC completed three engine-related integrated technology demonstrations. Promising technologies selected for maturation included an improved two-stage transonic high-pressure engine compressor for an advanced UHB turbofan, integration of a second-generation ultra-high bypass ratio propulsor, mechanism consisting of fan, stators, and nacelle, to improve propulse ion efficiency and reduce the noise of a geared turbofan engine, an improved design for a jet engine combustor to reduce NOx MS ions, and verification of HWB power plant and airframe integration concepts that would allow fuel consumption reductions in excess of 50% while simultaneously reducing noise on the ground. These demonstrations successfully advanced the maturation of compressor, propulsor, and combustor technologies for the next generation of jet engines. Two turbine engine design and performance gas turbine engines have been a fundamental part of aviation since the beginning of the jet age in the early 1940s. The two most common variants are the turbojet which produces thrust from the direct impulse of exhaust gases, and the turbofan, in which a set of ducted fan blades produces additional thrust. Turbofans tend to be inherently less noisy than turbojets and are thus better suited to requirements for quieter aircraft. In a jet engine, the compression system feeds high-pressure air into the combustion chamber, combustor, where it is heated before passing through a set of nozzle guide vanes to the turbine. Most modern designs are swirl-stabilized, creating a low-pressure zone and generating turbulence in the flow to rapidly mix fuel with air. However, the higher the turbulence, the higher the pressure. Loss for the combustor, so the swirler must be carefully designed so as not to generate more turbulence than necessary to sufficiently facilitate combustion. Three, The combustor converts chemical energy bound in the fuel into thermal energy to drive the compressor. The amount of thrust produced by a turbofan engine is the product of the mass of air per unit time and the change in velocity imparted to that mass. It is more efficient to impart a smaller velocity change on a large volume of air than to make a large velocity change to a smaller volume of air. The more efficient the engine, the less fuel is consumed. For these reasons, designers of turbofan technology have been developing engines with higher bypass ratios, BPR, and lower fan pressure ratios, FPR, in order to produce more efficient power plants with a high operating pressure ratio, OPR. One significant obstacle is the necessity to increase fan diameter to maintain consistent thrust. Increasing fan size adds weight and produces requirements for larger engine nacelles that add drag at higher airspeeds. More thrust is needed to overcome the additional drag. Four engine core size is another important factor because fan speed must be kept as low as possible to reduce its noise signature. However, since a common drive shaft connects the core components and the fan, lower fan speeds necessitate lower compressor and turbine component speeds in the engine core as well. A specific amount of power is required to drive the fan for a given amount of thrust. Therefore, as the fan speed drops, the core components must increase in size, both in number of stages and in stage diameter, to provide the necessary power since the core component speeds cannot increase. Larger components, or increased numbers of stages, add more weight to the engine, thus requiring increased fuel burn to carry that weight around. At some point, fan size increases to a point where the added weight of the fan and nacelle, the additional nacelle drag, and the increase in core weight overcomes the fuel advantage of the higher BPR and lower FPR design.5 The fuel burn trend line for a given engine cycle eventually drops to a minimum where increasing engine BPR beyond a certain point yields negative results, with higher fuel burn as increases in engine weight and size overcome the benefits of a high BPR engine cycle. With the technology available at the start of the ERA project, this phenomenon resulted from the conventional high bypass engine cycle known as direct drive, in which both fan and core components are rotating on the same shaft. Because the fan, compressor, and turbine all rotate at the same speed, system operation is constrained by the lowest speed component, 
which is the fan in the propulsor. A low-speed fan design forces the core to run at slower, less efficient speeds. As a result, more compressor and turbine stages are required to produce the necessary power to drive the fan and provide sufficient thrust at a given operating speed. Adding more stages increases engine weight. Six Pratt and Whitney designers sought to solve this problem by introducing a paradigm shifting advanced technology, the geared turbofan, GTF. In the GTF, the fan and the core components are separated by a gear system that allows the fan and the core to operate at different speeds. This allows the core to operate more efficiently and produce desired thrust levels at the fan stage, using fewer compressor and turbine stages compared to a direct drive engine. The net result is reduced engine weight and, therefore, greater fuel economy. 7 Pratt and Whitney developed the first generation GTF in partnership with NASA. Work began in 2006 with testing of a scale model in the 9 by 15 foot low speed wind tunnel at GRC. These tests validated the predicted aerodynamic, acoustic, and aeroelastic design characteristics of the GTF. Pratt and Whitney conducted the first full scale GTF engine demonstration in 2008 followed shortly thereafter by the first flight test demonstration using the company's modified Boeing 747 SP flying testbed. The first-generation GTF first entered service in January 2016 as the PW-1100 GJM. During development, NASA and Pratt and Whitney collaboratively investigated a low-speed-slash-low-pressure ratio fan, fan gear system, low-emissions combustor, and a compact high-speed low-pressure spool. These technologies enabled higher fan efficiencies by pushing engine BPR into the UHB ratio range of 12 or greater while allowing for FPR reduction of between 1.3 and 1.4.8. The PW1100G represented N plus 1 technology. At this level, researchers expected the GTF to once again reach a maximum benefit point as the design BPR continued to increase while FPR decreased. In order to achieve ERA N plus 2 system level environmental goals, this necessitated a second technological paradigm shift to significantly extend the beneficial fuel burn trend line. To this end, NASA and Pratt and Whitney again partnered to investigate second-generation GTF propulsor technologies to enable a BPR up to 18 and an FPR of between 1.25 and 1.3. Researchers projected the second-generation GTF would provide a 25-30% to reduction compared to an Airbus A320 powered by two Pratt and Whitney V2500 engines. Nine Another unconventional propulsion technology considered during ERA was the prop fan, or open rotor, engine. NASA had previously explored this concept, also known as an unducted fan, UDF, as early as the mid-1980s but it was never adopted by the aircraft industry. Superficially, the front end of the UDF resembled that of a turbojet or turbofan, featuring a conventional circular air inlet. At the back end of the nacelle, however, it sported an unshrouded, contra-rotating propeller consisting of a large number of short, twisted fan blades.10 After initial flight testing, the UDF was largely shunned due to the excess sive cabin noise it generated compared with turbofan engines. ERA researchers chose to revisit this technology because it offered the potential for large increases in propulsion efficiency and, therefore, significant reduction in fuel burn compared with then current high BPR turbofans. Open rotor engines represent the ultimate in high BPR propulsion, typically providing BPRs between 40 and 80 as well as very low FPRs, below 1.1, compared with other types of aircraft power plants, and thus offering very high propulsive efficiency overall. Designers at General Electric Aviation predicted that their open-rotor concept had the potential to reduce fuel burn by as much as 25-30% to compared to such modern turbofan engines as the company's own GECFM 565B.11 with renewed emphasis on reducing the environmental impact of commercial aircraft. NASA partnered with General Electric to investigate open rotor propulsion for ERA N plus 2 generation aircraft systems. As a starting point, the company built upon its experience with the GE 36 proof of concept UDF demonstrator that had been successfully flight tested in 1986 and 1987, winning the prestigious Collier Trophy. By 2009, designers of a new generation of open rotor engines had access to tremendous increases in aerodynamic design capability and computational fluid dynamics, advanced high speed computers, and strong lightweight materials technology that had been developed over the preceding two decades. General Electric designers could now take advantage of advanced tailored construction techniques to optimize fan blade shapes for maximum performance and minimum noise. In 2010, this effort spawned an extensive series of tests at GRC of a new generation of advanced fan blade technology, sponsored through both the SFW and ERA projects. 12 This led to three ERA propulsion ITDs that were focused on increased thermal efficiency, 
increased propulsive efficiency and noise reduction, and low NOx combustor designs for high pressure ratio engines. 13 highly loaded front block compressor demonstration. The first demonstration, ITD 30A, sought to improve overall aircraft engine efficiency with a view toward reducing TSFC and total fuel burn, as well as those enabling technologies needed for developing high OPR core engines. TSFC quantifies the fuel efficiency of an engine design with respect to thrust output. Researchers hope to increase both efficiency and core pressure by 30% relative to ERA baseline engine specifications in order to achieve a 2.5% TSFC reduction. To this end, a highly loaded front block compressor. Demonstration included two test and analysis campaigns to improve both propulsive efficiency and engine core thermal efficiency. In order to meet ERA goals, designers had to increase engine OPR and efficiency without adversely affecting system weight, length, diameter, or operability. In the first campaign, which took place during ERA Phase 1, researchers investigated the performance of the two front stages of a legacy high OPR six-stage core compressor. ERA Phase 2 focused on two major variants of a new compressor design.14 for ITD-30A, NASA researchers partnered with designers at General Electric to refine the design of the open rotor compressor stage of a UHB turbofan engine. This work mainly focused on increasing engine core thermal efficiency by boosting the engine's OPR via a pressure ratio increase in the high-pressure compressor, HPC. Boosting OPR by adding more compressor stages would also increase the engine's weight and complexity, so the team chose a novel approach. They opted to enhance the capability of the HPC's front block, comprising the first three stages, through increased stage loading while simultaneously maintaining compressor efficiency comparable to that of state-of-the-art HPCs. For the purposes of the ERA demonstration, Technol Augi development and maturation activities focused on improving the pressure rise across the first three stages of a 30-to-1 class HPC. According to James D. Heidman, project engineer for the ERA Propulsion Technology subproject, the primary objective was to validate innovative engineering concepts and models for higher OPR in an advanced technology development compressor, ATDC, test bed to achieve NASA fuel burn and NOx emissions goals. 15 Phase 1 demonstration in preparation for ERA Phase 1 testing. NASA collaborated and developed cost sharing protocols with industry partners, academia, and other government agencies to create and operate the ATDC test bed in the W7 multi stage compressor test facility at NASA Glenn Research Center. During Phi 2010 to 2011, this necessitated refurbishing the test rig straddle mounted driveline, balancing a 640 pound five stage checkout rotor, and installing a new high temperature throttle valve. The facility's 15,000 horsepower synchronous drive motor was capable of operation between 300 and 3,600 revolutions per minute and was equipped with a 5.21 to 1 ratio gearbox, enabling a maximum compressor shaft speed of nearly 20,000 revolutions per minute. NASA researchers worked with Pratt & Whitney, General Electric, and Rolls-Royce to define the basic operating envelope for the W7 compressor rig while also designing and fabricating the ATDC Phase A. Test Article.16 Ultimately, NASA was responsible for refurbishing the W7 facility and conducting the ATDC tests. General Electric received a contract to provide an advanced two-stage compressor test article and additional test support. Research goals focused on making steady and unsteady flow measurements, initially for the first stage by itself and then subsequently after adding the second stage. This would enable detailed evaluation of the performance and losses in each stage.17 baseline and developmental testing of the state-of-the-art transonic high-pressure compressor began in Phi 2012. Researchers primarily sought to understand the flow physics that typically limit stage loading, characterize interactions between the various rows of compressor blades, and validate the design methodology and capability of predictive tools through comparison with experimental results. Initial checkout of the W7 facility driveline was conducted in June 2012. When technicians operated the driveline motor up to 9,000 revolutions per minute, they detected a vibration in the gearbox that was later diagnosed as an issue with the coupling between the gearbox and compressor shaft. Modifications to the coupling installation eliminated the problem. 18 in September, General Electric delivered the compressor test rig to GRC, where it was installed in the W7 facility for testing. Researchers then validated the bidirectional capability of the W7 motor drive and worked to increase flow quality and reduce measurement uncertainty within the multi stage compressor facility. The results of pre test computational fluid dynamics, CFD, Simulations were compared to experiment data to determine the breakout of the stage 1 and stage 2 blade row interaction effects that limit stage loading and high OPR capability. 
General Electric performed system studies that indicated the highly loaded front block compressor would provide a 25% increase in OPR relative to that of the GE90, then the world's most powerful turbofan engine. Notably, this would result in a 2.0 to 2.5% reduction in TSFC.19 when these tests concluded in 2015. The results indicated that highly loaded core compressor technology developed under the ERA project had successfully realized fuel burn reduction goals by increasing compressor OPR to increase the engine's thermal efficiency. Contemporary turbofan engines then in service operated at an OPR of 30 to 45. The new research results potentially paved the way for engines with an OPR between 60 and 70, nearly doubling the compressor pressure ratio performance while retaining a high level of efficiency. Because previous General Electric test experience of a similar two-stage compressor had failed to meet high-speed efficiency goals due to unpredicted pressure losses, the new test article was designed to run in both one-stage and two-stage configurations in separate tests to assess whether interaction between the bow shock of the second rotor and the upstream stage contributed to the anomaly, or if the anomaly was due to interaction between the first-stage rotor and stator sections. Losses encountered in the earlier tests were not fully understood and had not been predicted by sophisticated CFD simulations, including multi-blade row unsteady modeling of the inlet guide vane through rotor 2.20. The primary research goal of the next set of tests was enabling engineers to fully understand first-stage performance under isolated and multi-stage conditions. Secondary goals included developing a detailed set of aerodynamic data for CFD model validation. Researchers initially ran the compressor in a one-stage configuration to fully characterize and understand stage 1 in isolation, and then subsequently ran both stages together. This allowed them to isolate the effect of the rotor 2 bow shock as it impinged on the upstream blade rows. Advanced diagnostic instrumentation provided data that allowed the team to fully understand the loss mechanisms, thus permitting designers to develop highly loaded front stages that mitigate the identified losses and permit the core compressor to reach target efficiency levels. 21 General Electric provided a test article that included an air inlet and the first two stages of a highly loaded axial compressor. The first test assembly consisted of an inlet, fan frame struts, guide vanes, rotor 1, and stator 1, with a downstream to swirl vane to maintain axial flow. The configuration for the second test consisted of all of these components plus a transition duct from the low-pressure compressor to the high-pressure compressor, a second rotor and stator, and no to swirl vane. The inlet guide vanes in both stators were of a variable geometry configuration and were designed to follow a vane schedule corresponding to the rotation speed. Researchers acquired data at various off-schedule vane angles in order to assess performance at different rotor loading values. 22 technicians installed a variety of instrumentation to obtain performance maps during the single-stage compressor test. Most of these data were acquired at 97% and 100% NC, that is, corrected speed, the speed at which a component would rotate if the inlet temperature corresponded to ambient conditions at sea level, on a standard day. Pressure rakes mounted at mid-pitch of the struts in five circumferential locations allowed researchers to establish inlet total pressure and temperature profiles. Steady-state static pressure ports located above the rotor tips identified rotor start and unstart conditions and captured rotor shock and tip vortex data. Two rows of high-response pressure transducers measured the unsteady pressure over the rotor to provide a detailed perspective of the rotor static pressure field. Two stator vanes were instrumented with total pressure probes along five radial locations on the leading edges to obtain rotor performance data, and two others were similarly instrumented with temperature sensors. Five circumferentially spaced rakes situated downstream of stator one at the leading edge of the de swirl vane may assured stator exit flow. Additional data were provided by sensors that captured casing and hub static pressures along the entire flow path from the inlet through the diffuser section. Researchers determined overall performance of the one-stage configuration by measuring the difference between readings taken at the inlet and exit rakes. Detailed measurements with a traversing probe averaging data taken at four points across the diameter of the exit duct provided finer data definitions. 23 The research team then installed the second stage on the test article and repeated the data runs. This design configuration pushed the design to higher blade loading levels, pressure rise per stage, but failed to meet efficiency goals. Test results indicated that stage 2 was choking at a mass flow rate that prevented stage 1 from reaching peak efficiency. Upon reviewing the data from both configurations to determine the most likely cause of this stage mismatch, researchers found that stator 1 performed equally well with or without the presence of the second stage. They concluded that the performance deficit was likely from a first stage loss not predicted by available design tools. Phase 1 testing yielded a vast amount of high-quality data, but much work remained. Most important, 
the resulting dataset could be used to validate CFD models and help determine how to redesign the compressor system while accounting for loss mechanisms.24. Phase 2 demonstration flow across the span of the front two compressor stages was transonic. As a result, stage performance was very sensitive to changes in the effective flow area. Such changes can affect flow separation, as well as cause low momentum and loss due to passage shock and or blade row interactions. During Phase 1 testing, researchers sought to understand the flow physics that resulted in high losses, characterize blade row interactions and their impact on loss, and validate the design methodology and capability of the prediction tools through comparisons with experimental results. Phase 2 testing involved a completely new core compressor design strategy that leveraged lessons learned from the Phase 1 compressor design. This new compressor was designed for increased efficiency and higher blade loading.25 The primary goals of Phase 2 were to realize higher efficiency levels than those of Phase 1 and increase blade loading levels relative to those of the best design then available, but not to the higher levels of blade loading attempted in the Phase 1 design. The Phase 2 compressor test program was undertaken in the third and fourth quarters of Phi 2015. It consisted of two tests designated Build 1 and Build 2, where the primary difference was that Build 2 was designed to achieve higher compressor blade loading at the same efficiency levels as Build 1. The higher blade loading of Build 2 provided an overall system benefit because compressor bleed locations could be moved further upstream, reducing the compressor work required to provide the bleed flow.26 second generation ultra high bypass propulsor integration during another demonstration, ITD 35A, in late 2011. NASA researchers worked with Pratt and Whitney to mature several low FPR, UHB propulsor technologies through a series of collaborative tests of a scale model second generation GTF in the NASA GRC 9 by 15 foot low speed wind tunnel. Prior to ERA, first generation GTF testing demonstrated the potential efficiency gains that could be achieved with low FPR, geared fan propulsor systems. Designers developed a fan architecture that served as a basis for the PW1500G engine but the success of the demonstration at GRC motivated the company to evolve the technology for use in larger thrust class engines. One of the most important improvements involved the addition of a gear to the fan drive system to allow the low tip speed, low FPR fan to be coupled to a smaller, more efficient high-speed core. This lowered the minimum fuel burn FPR but resulted in a necessarily larger fan diameter so as to produce an equivalent amount of thrust. This was significant because increased fan size could result in and prohibitively large high drag nacelles. Shortening the length of the nacelle would increase the acoustic signature, so designers also had to explore noise reduction technologies.27. Acoustic liners offered one possible solution, but engines with large diameter fans and short nacelles provide limited internal surface area for acoustic liners, and the effectiveness of these liners is also decreased due to the less optimal lift to drag ratio of the bypass duct. NASA ERA researchers increased the acoustic treatment area and the propulsor through development of two advanced liner concepts that came to be known as over-the-rotor, OTR, and soft vanes, SV. The OTR concept featured an acoustically designed casing treatment installed above the rotor tip region. The proprietary design absorbed pressure fluctuations at the source before the sound could propagate for any appreciable distance. The SV concept employed cylindrical folded passages inside the fan exit guide vanes to absorb pressure fluctuations at their source. 28 results were mixed. Researchers conducted separate tests of the OTR and SV concepts employing a legacy fan with a 1.5 FPR, both in a rotor only configuration to analyze any performance impact as well as inside a production type nacelle configuration to measure the resulting acoustic characteristics. Noise measurements taken of the rotor alone demonstrated minimal and acceptable efficiency losses resulting from the OTR treatment. Acoustic results from SV tests with the nacelle installed achieved a noise reduction of 1.5 dB, but there was no comparable noise reduction using the OTR concept in the same configuration. Test data suggested that OTR deficiencies likely resulted from manufacturing difficulties as well as from acoustic design limitations for the rotor tip flow field conditions. Bypass duct pressure losses have a greater influence on engine TSFC for low FPR engine cycles than relative to legacy engines. Pratt and Whitney and NASA researchers explored this phenomenon while testing concepts for low-loss fan exit guide vanes, FUCs, and methods for optimizing duct end wall contouring in combination with axial spacing changes to limit total nacelle length. These tests validated a design concept resulting in lower duct slash FUC pressure losses for advanced propulsor configurations. A final series of tests in 2014 and 2015 focused on a scale model of the FAA-sponsored clean engine, an open-rotor UHB power plant designed by Pratt & Whitney for increased performance and reduced noise comparable to existing turbofan levels. 
The wind tunnel model used for the integrated systems test featured a drooped inlet, bifurcated bypass duct, exit guide vanes, and a non-axisymmetric bypass duct. One of the primary objectives of the experiment, which concluded in June 2015, was to compare model scale acoustic results to those acquired from later full-scale engine static testing. ERA performance goals for ITD35A called for a 9% reduction in TSFC and a 15 at B cumulative noise reductian relative to the baseline engine. NASA and Pratt and Whitney team members were pleased to conclude that the test results validated both the aerodynamic and acoustic performance of the new propulsor section technologies. 29 Low NOx Fuel Flexible Combustor Integration A series of increasingly stringent government NOx emission standards imposed by the ICAO SEEP over the years has limited aviation emissions below 3,000 foot altitudes. SEEP standards cover the landing, takeoff, descent, and taxiing phases of engine operation in a prorated fashion. Goals set for ERA included a demonstration of a low NOx, Fuel flexible combustor designed to provide a 75% reduction in emissions below SEEP 6 standards without increasing particulate matter, and with minimal impact on fuel burn and NOS targets. ERA researchers recognized that the primary technical challenge centered on the fact that to meet fuel burn reduction targets, advanced engines must au pair aid at higher pressures and temperatures that encourage NOx production. New, advanced injector designs and air slash fuel mixing concepts, such as lean direct injection, LDI, were required to meet emissions targets and provide fuel flexibility. Leaner burn concepts, however, tend to provide less stability margin and require fuel staging and combustion control. ERA planners, therefore, established the Low NOx Fuel Flexible Combustor Integration Demonstration, ITD-40A, to reduce technical risks and mature a new fuel flexible combustor concept from Pratt and Whitney that would maintain low NOx emissions at the higher cycle conditions expected of future engines. 30 emissions during landing and takeoff affect local air quality, and above 3,000 feet they account for 92% of total ozone, said ERA combustor task lead chimingly. But, he added, the problem is that the NOx MS science increases overall pressure ratio increases, particularly above 50 to 1, so it is a tremendous challenge for us. The answer lay in balancing an advanced combustor design with an improved fuel-air mixer and a lean direct injection combustion system. Lee observed, every time we improve fuel mixing, the NOx drops. 31 For the ERA Phase 1 demonstration in 2012, Lee's team began by testing a single injector flame tube before progressing to multi-injector sector. Combustor trials using arc-shaped partial combustor rings and, ultimately, a full annular, ring-shaped, combustor test aimed at substantial NOx reductions of up to 80% by 2015. Researchers focused on maturing injector design, active combustion, and advanced liner technologies from TRL3 to at least TRL5. Among the active combustor concepts studied were devices designed to carefully control combustion instability and incorporate an intelligent fuel-slash-air management system. They also studied advanced liners made from fiber-reinforced silicon carbide matrix ceramic composites, known as 6-6 CMCs, capable of reducing combustor cooling air requirements. We need 80% of the air in front of the combustor to get fuel-slash-air mixing going and that's going to come from the combustor liner, said Lee. His team also sought to further refine existing fuel injectors to accommodate alternative jet fuels such as those produced through the fischer trops process, in which fuel is synthesized from non-petroleum sources such as coal, natural gas, and renewable biomass. According to Lee, this provides more opportunities for emissions reductions because, fischer tropsk fuel has no aromatics, no sulfur and its distillation profile is different, it can vaporize quicker than jet fuel, and the viscosity is less. This, in turn, means droplet size is 10 to 20% smaller. 32 Pratt & Whitney's Experimental Axial Stage Combustor, ASC, was designed to operate on the lean-lean concept, in which the engine burns fuel with an excessive air as compared with conventional engines. This would enable increased fuel combustion while simultaneously decreasing hydrocarbon emissions. Two types of fuel injectors were employed during different thrust conditions. When operating at low power conditions, the ASC concept used a pilot injector at the front of the combustor, while additional main injectors were used in addition to the pilot injector for high power conditions. The key to maintaining low NOx production at N plus 2 cycle conditions was to keep the fuel-air mixture as lean as practical throughout the entire axial length of the combustor.33 During ERA Phase 1, researchers from NASA, General Electric, and Pratt and & Whitney validated lean burn combustor performance through a series of flame tube, sector, and full annular tests in the GRC ASCR facility. Prior to testing, the ASCR was upgraded to provide entrance conditions of 900 pounds per inch to absolute, 
SIA, and temperatures up to 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit. To meet ERA goals researchers pursued multiple concepts including a lean partial mixed combustor and lean direct multi-injection system. The results of flame tube tests were used to select the most promising candidates for additional sector rig and annular combustor testing. An integrated CMC and environmental barrier coating, EBC, liner system made it possible to supply more air for fuel-slash-air mixing because less cooling air was required than for an engine with a conventional metallic liner.34 under the ERA project. Engine designers sought to develop combustor concepts having a high OPR engine cycle that met specified N plus 2 noise, fuel burn, and emissions goals as part of an overall aircraft system. Advanced lean burn concepts offered by General Electric were based on previous efforts tested under the NASA-sponsored Ultra-Efficient Engine Technology, UEET, program of the 1990s. This led to development of the twin annular premixing swirler, TAPS, combustor, most recently included in the Gen X-1B and Gen X-2B engines that power the Boeing 787 and 747-8 wide-body aircraft, respectively. Features of the TAPS design included independently controlled, swirl-stabilized, annular flames for low-power, pilot, and high-power, main, operation. In this configuration, a concentric main flame holder surrounded the central pilot flame. By itself, the pilot flame not only provided good low-power operability, but also resulted in reduced carbon monoxide and hydrocarbon emiss science. The main burner was optimized to produce low NOx emissions during high-power operation. Incorporating advanced liner materials benefited the combustion system in terms of both durability and emissions by decreasing cooling air requirements and enabling a higher fraction of combustion air in the main mixer for lower NOx emissions.35 in a jet engine. The flame tube is designed to allow a percentage of the air that enters the combustion chamber to mix with the fuel inside the combustine chamber. It also controls the ignition process, so the flame never actually touches the walls of the chamber or extends back into the turbine section. Researchers tested several advanced TAPS injector concepts in a flame tube configuration to evaluate emissions, combustion dynamics, and auto ignition margins up to full operating conditions. The results demonstrated acceptable operability margins at takeoff conditions and indicated that landing and takeoff emissions would likely exceed ERA targets. Based on analysis of test results, the research team selected the most effective injector design for incorporation into an advanced five cup sector rig in the ASCR. Data obtained during the latter half of 2012 over the entire flight envelope, including high power operation, met the conditions required for calculating the ICAO landing and takeoff NOx emissions levels for engines with an overall pressure ratio of 50 to 1. Preliminary results indicated that the General Electric Combustor concept has the potential to meet ERA goals. 36 engineers at Pratt and Whitney and United Technologies Research Center, UTRC, in East Hartford, Connecticut employed modern tools to improve fuel-slash-air mixing at individual injection points in order to reduce the number of injection points by a factor of two compared to previous designs, and to instigate a variety of advanced concepts. This effort resulted in several configurations that featured lean-staged multipoint designs, radially-staged swirlers, rich quench lean, RQL, combustors, and axially-staged combustors. These concepts offered simplicity, operability, durability, and emissions levels that ultimately made the RQL family of combustors a staple in Pratt & Whitney engines. The company's Talon X combustor was developed with support from NASA under the UEAT program and was selected for use in a GTF engine slated for several future Airbus, Bombardier, and Mitsubishi aircraft.37. Initial testing at UTRC used an idealized single nozzle rig at 7 and 30% power settings for a variety of injector configurations and fuel-slash-air ratios. The results demonstrated that all of these concepts could produce emissions results below the ERA goals set by NASA. A few of the concepts not only performed very well with regard to NOx emissions but also demonstrated excellent efficiency. Following additional testing and analysis, one injector concept was selected for evaluation in an advanced three-cup sector rig in the ASCR facility in 2012. As with the General Electric Combustor design, results were extremely encouraging.38 for lean combustion cycles, up to 70% of the total combustor airflow has to be premixed with fuel before entering the combustion chamber. Cooling flow must therefore be reduced accordingly to provide sufficient air for mixing. An optimized fuel-slash-air mixture is key to lowering flame temperatures and reducing thermal NOx formation. At the beginning of ERA Phase 1, researchers considered a 75% reduction goal for landing and takeoff NOx emissions to be a significant challenge for partial premix combustor configurations such as those being pursued by both Pratt & Whitney and General Electric. As an additional hedge, 
In case the partial premix systems demonstrated unresolvable auto ignition issues at the higher inlet pressure and temperature conditions, ERA researchers also pursued lean direct injection concepts from industry partners Goodrich, Woodward FST, and Parker Hannafin.39. Although limited in scope, these efforts aggressively explored radical new ideas such as burning blends of up to 80% alternative fuel to 20% ordinary jet fuel. These designs pushed multipoint LDI concepts that NASA had been working on for more than two decades to new levels of maturity. LDI is ideal for ultra-high pressure engine operation in which the flame front moves closer to the injectors than it does in conventional power plants. Some of these concepts also incorporated fuel flow control features to prevent instability. After evaluating several designs, Goodrich engineers down-selected their best concept and began lean blow-off testing in the NASA high-pressure flame tube facility at GRC. Unfortunately, testing had to be temporarily suspended due to a fuel leak and was scheduled for completion at a later date. Woodward FST researchers completed light-off and lean blow-off testing of their injector concept using their own facilities as well as NASA's. Parker Hannafin tested the fuel spray and lean blow-off characteristics of a new miniaturized fuel valve actuator design for fast response time for combustion control. 40 The ERA combustor technology maturation plan involved parallel research activities at different TRL levels. For example, low TRL flame tube tests of several swirler concepts were ongoing throughout much of Phase 2, with the most promising concepts being down-selected for further demonstration in sector tests. Even before all these latter tests were completed, engineers had to freeze the swirler design that was to be tested using the full annular rig. This technique kept things moving along and allowed researchers to demonstrate the best available technology to the highest possible TRL allowed by the design slash test schedule. 41 test results from ERA phase 1 in 2012 indicated that partial premix concepts from both Pratt and Whitney and General Electric had the potential to meet NASA NOx goals without LDI, active combustion control, or alternative fuels. Researchers conducted tests involving conventional and blended alternative fuels in all three test rigs, flame tube, arc sector, and full annular, to build a state-of-the-art emissions, performance, and fuel flexibility database that would eventually enable development of combustors that might be integrated into commercial fleets by 2025. At the end of Phase 1, the Pratt & Whitney ASC concept was selected for continued technology maturation from TRL4 to TRL5 during Phase 2. Plans for these tests called for using a sector combustor rig to demonstrate improved operability over Phase 1 results for a full range of operational conditions including ambient inlet temperatures as high as 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit, compressor pressures up to 50 atmospheres, and a maximum flame temperature of 3,000 degrees. 42 UTRC and GRC arc sector testing performed during the first year of Phase 2 focused on system integration and fuel flexibility. Initial testing with the UTRC sector rig validated performance of second-generation concepts previously explored in a single nozzle rig by researchers from NASA, UTRC, Georgia Institute of Technology, and the University of Connecticut. Here, researchers sought to obtain low power emissions points and determine how to best operate and stage the combustor configuration. Experiments included designs featuring combustor liners, cooling techniques, and a variety of different fuel nozzles. In order to substantiate and refine the design, researchers assess system integration aspects across a range of operational temperatures and pressures. They also measured low power efficiency, lean blowout, and emissions performance, and explored an acoustic boundary condition to explore dynamic stability of the design refinements with respect to pilot main fuel flow splits. Such realistic engine conditions were necessary for defining combustor inlet pressure and temperature levels based on a Pratt & Whitney advanced engine concept capable of meeting the NASA N plus 2 noise, emissions, and performance goals. 43 In the second year of Phase 2 testing, Pratt & Whitney designers incorporated those features from Phase 1 that appeared to best meet production requirements and emissions and performance goals. The company then provided these improved combustors to NASA for further evaluation. Sector testing of these concepts in the ASCR facility represented a critical risk reduction element in the development process. It validated performance and emissions at realistic full engine pressures and temperatures and flame temperatures, enabling performance to be measured over the complete range of operating conditions rather than having to extrapolate from limited data. Pratt & Whitney fabricated a full annular ring test article representing the second generation combustor configuration. This underwent 100 hours of testing in the company's X960 rig at Middletown, Connecticut, to validate combustor emissions, pattern and profile factors, thermal gradient variations, lighting, lean blowout, operability, dynamics, and heat loading. 44 The process of designing, fabricating, 
and assembling the full annular comm buster gave Pratt and Whitney the opportunity to address mechanical design and packaging issues unique to the ASC architecture, including a complete fuel system. This allowed designers to accelerate the maturity of the concept and enable its incorporation into future engines. Emissions measurements were correlated with those made while testing the ARC sector test article at UTRC and GRC. Researchers learned from experience that for rich burn, quick mix, lean burn, also known as rich quench lean, or RQL, combustors, NOx emissions measured in ARC sector rigs are quantitatively predictive of measurements taken from full annular assemblies as well as from complete engines. The full annular test also enabled measurement of stage-to-stage -stage transition characteristics. Researchers used these data to improve combustor operation readiness. Additionally, the long-duration test provided durability data to finalize the cooling characteristics of combustor liners in preparation for full-scale engine testing. Inclusion of a full fuel system allowed researchers to evaluate techniques for the mitigation of traveling wave tangential mode combustion acoustics, thereby enabling quieter engines. 45 prior to ASCR high pressure sector testing, researchers pre-screened injector slash swirler concepts and flame tube tests at GRC and UTRC, and also conducted a lower pressure sector test at UTRC. Back in the ASCR, the same sector hardware was subsequently evaluated throughout the full operating envelope from sea level takeoff to relight and lean blowout. The full annular combustor test, using the same injectors and swirlers as in the ASCR sector test, was completed in June 2015. Preliminary analysis of results confirmed the ASCR NOx data from ASCR and demonstrated good emission performance using standard jet A fuel. Additional sector testing with the 50-50 blend of FT alternative fuel demonstrated combustor emissions performance and operability characteristics nearly identical to the results with Jet A.46. These successful results indicated performance acceptable for commercial airline operation and advanced the Pratt and Whitney combustor concept from TRL4 to TRL5. Most important, ITD-40A was declared fully successful when the full annular test rig achieved 75% landing and takeoff NOx reductine and 70% cruise level NOx reduction over a 2005 state-of-the-art engine. Total system level impacts, however, could only be thoroughly validated through testing of a complete full-scale engine. The results of ITD-40A established that the Pratt & Whitney ACS combustor was ready for such testing and provided critical operational and performance data necessary to develop test plans and technology development roadmaps for advancing the technology from TRL5 to 6.47 UHB engine integration for hybrid wing body concepts although most ERA propulsion technology demonstrations were applicable to a wide variety of turbine-driven aircraft configurations, one ITD specify Cali addressed how best to integrate UHB engines with a hybrid wing body concept. Conventional tube and wing configurations are typically equipped with engine pods mounted beneath the wings. For the purpose of noise reductine, ERA researchers proposed installing two or more engines on top of the HWB airframe at the aft end, between the tails. While this arrangement offered shielding benefits for reducing community noise, it also posed questions with regard to aerodynamics and performance. Carried out under the ERA Vehicle Systems Integration Subproject, ITD-51A addressed the need to quantify the impact of engine-slash-airframe integration on HWB system performance as well as noise levels across key on and off design conditions. This directly supported a technical challenge to demonstrate reduced component noise signatures totaling 42 at mean noise reduction for the entire aircraft system while simultaneously minimizing weight and integration penalties to enable an overall 50% fuel burn reduction at the aircraft system level. 48 for purposes of this subproject, researchers focused on a twin engine HWB configuration equipped with UHB turbofan engines. Airframe slash power plant integration was considered critical to success from performance drag instability and control, engine operability, and noise shielding perspectives. The two major areas of interest were aerodynamic efficiency and engine operability. Such details as nacelle size and location relative to oncoming airflow at cruise and low-speed conditions, placement and size of the vertical tails, and distance between the engines and aft deck would influence interference drag effects as well as overall stability and control characteristics. ERA researchers also wanted to explore airflow dynamics at low speeds, high angle of attack, and during crosswind operation to characterize their effects on the operability of the inlets, fans, and nozzles before the HWB concept could be considered a viable technology option for commercial transport vehicles. 49 During ITD-51A, 
NASA partnered with Boeing to design and validate a concept for the HWB that minimized adverse propulsion slash airframe induced interference effects that might result in high drag or poor aerodynamic char characteristics. Designers used CFD modeling and wind tunnel tests to quantify key design trade space issues that could impact UHB engine operability in HWB configurations and minimize adverse effects. Key objectives included characterizing airframe-dominated flows on the operability of UHB engines at key-off design conditions, low speeds, high angles of attack, and side slip, and characterizing the performance, drag, lift, stability and control, propulsion-induced effects, etc. of the resulting HWB propulsion-slash-airframe integration designed throughout the Mach number range. In order to fully advance the knowledge and TRL of UHB engine integration on the HWB, Researchers also evaluated methods for integrating a large diameter fan slash nacelle configuration with various N plus 2 vehicle concepts. This included investigations into how best to address nacelle weight for large diameter fans, the viability of shorter inlets to reduce nacelle drag, and the use of thrust reversers, variable area nozzles, and low noise fan designs. 50 wind tunnel models for this demonstration were based on Boeing's PSC from ERA Phase 1 updated with design refinements to address all key performance metrics and ERA goals as well as potential issues uncovered during prior HWB design studies. Boeing developed an HWB configuration designated N2AX day under a NASA NRA in 2012, but initial low-speed wind tunnel testing revealed slight problems with airframe-generated inlet flow distortion. Boeing subsequently revised the design in the areas of planform, propulsion aerodynamic integration, high lift systems, and propulsion system sizing. The updated PSC design also addressed fundamental requirements for weight and balance, and stability and control. Designers focused particularly on low-speed inlet distortion and recovery, engine installation drag penalty at cruise conditions, noise effects resulting from engine position relative to the body trailing edge, maximum lift coefficient, CL max, at takeoff and landing, and cruise lift to drag ratio, LD. These design trades resulted in significant changes to the original platform and wing leading edge sweep to improve both stability and control and center of gravity characteristics. Additionally, designers discovered National Full Scale Aerodynamics Complex, NFAC, 40 by 80 foot test section with a Boeing HWB model. The size of the NASA personnel gives a sense of the immense size of this now 70 year old facility. NASA. That integration of the propulsion system above the wing body posed challenges for both low-speed operability and high-speed cruise drag. After observing shock interactions between the nacelles and the body at high speeds, Boeing engineers performed a rigorous optimization study to minimize installed drag of the engine nacelle at transonic conditions. 51 NASA researchers tested three configurations of a 5.75% scale HWB model in the Langley 14 by 22 foot subsonic wind tunnel and in the 40 by 80 foot test section of the National Full Scale Aerodynamics Complex, NFAC, at Ames. These configurations included an HWB with flow through nacelles, one with ejector powered inlets, and another with turbine powered engine simulators, TPS. Researchers first performed flow through nacelle testing while optimizing a high lift system for takeoff and landing conditions. This involved the use of Kruger flaps, lift enhancement devices that may be fitted to the leading edge of an aircraft wing. This model configuration was also used for force and moment testing. Next, they replaced the flow through nacelles with ejector powered inlets to simulate scaled mass conditions at the engine inlet. The objectives of this test were twofold. First, researchers needed to characterize inlet flow distortion, particularly that induced by peculiarities of HWB airframe slash propulsion integration. Second, they attempted to mitigate such adverse effects by varying inlet height and Kruger settings. Researchers felt that because the engines were mounted on the aft body upper surface, the inlets might be susceptible to vortex ingestion originating from the wing leading edge at high angles of attack and sideslip, and from separated wing slash body flow. Finally, devices that simulated scaled exhaust flow were installed to characterize the power on effects of engine exhaust flow on increased pitching moment and 11 effectiveness.52 as originally outlined by ERA planners. All wind tunnel testing for ITD-51A was to be accomplished in the La RC subsonic tunnel, a closed circuit, single return, atmospheric wind tunnel capable of producing a maximum speed of 348 feet per second. Unfortunately, this facility suffered a failure of the main fan drive in September 2014 at the beginning of the first series of ejector test runs. Investigators estimated it would take as much as one year to repair the motor, 
a delay that would have extended the wind tunnel test campaign beyond the scheduled end of the ERA project in September of 2015. In order to remain on schedule, all subsequent testing was relocated to the NFAC, and testing resumed in January 2015.53. Moving these experiments to the NFAC provided an unexpected opportunity to acquire acoustic data to refine noise estimates. Originally, there were no plans to take direct acoustic measurements of the HWB model during tunnel runs in the La RC subsonic facility. Instead, the project plan called for all such estimates to be done computationally. With its much larger test section, the NFAC had room for a phased array acoustic measurement system. Prior to runs with the flow through nacelles, researchers installed a traversing array below the left wing of the HWB model to measure Kruger flap noise under Varios conditions. Pretest CFD modeling results determined the most effective positioning for the acoustic array to provide high signal to noise ratios without inducing adverse aerodynamic effects on the test article. Researchers used the array to acquire data for a number of different Kruger flap configurations, dynamic pressure sweeps ranging from 20 to 60 PSF, angle of attack sweeps from 0 to 16 degrees, and emission angles from 60 to 120 degrees. Preliminary results indicated that noise generated by the Kruger flaps largely depended on the size of the gap between the flap and the wing leading edge. High resolution beamform images showed the acoustic research team that flap brackets were the primary noise sources on the leading edge, and that a sealed gap configure tie and produced high lift noise comparable to the baseline cruise configuration. 54 researchers also used CFD modeling to validate the Boeing HWB design would meet fuel burn performance goals by assessing the vehicle's transonic performance characteristics. Although plans originally called for this to be accomplished using a combination of CFD and wind tunnel test data, program constraints resulted in the elimination of high speed, transonic testing from the project. Consequently, all transonic performance characterization of the HWB design was done exclusively using predictive models. To build confidence in the CFD predictions, NASA and Boeing performed independent assessments. The NASA team made computations using an unstructured grid code called USM 3 d and Boeing performed calculations using a structured grid code called Overflow, both of which are fully turbulent, Reynolds averaged Navier Stokes flow solvers. NASA's goal was to assess Boeing's overall process for determining interference drag and develop a database of independent CFD solutions for comparison. In general, agreement between the two independent simulations was excellent.55 because mounting the engines on the upper aft fuselage of the HWBCR created the potential for flow distortion from the forebody to be ingested into the engines when flying at high angles of attack. Pratt and Whitney performed an assessment of inlet distortion effects on engine and fan operability. The severity of this phenomenon, ranging from flow angularity and swirl distortion to total inlet pressure loss, was a function of the BWB for body design, including high lift devices such as Kruger flaps as well as aerodynamic operating conditions, Mach, angle of attack, and side slip. Researchers used both computational modeling and experimental data obtained from the project to identify such potential threats to the engine as fan stall, low pressure compressor stall, and fan blade vibratory stress. Although any significant inlet distortion affected engine performance to some degree, this represented an off-design condition that did not affect the overall mission fuel burn assessment. At this point, the team concluded that the technology readiness level for the operability and blade stress assessment was for all intents and purposes TRL 4.56 in order to evaluate Boeing's PSC, the company supplied data for inlet distortion at a number of limiting conditions derived from CFD at the Complete aircraft configuration at full scale. For all inlet distortion cases that fell within the expected operational envelope of the PSC configuration, engine operability and fan blade stress metrics were determined to be within acceptable limits. Therefore, designers at Boeing saw no reason to modify the PSC engine-slash-airframe integration concept. The only marginal or unacceptable assessments resulted from inlet distortion analysis cases that were well outside the predicted operating envelope of the PSC aircraft. These results provided confidence that the operability assessment methodologies were producing reasonable results. 57 Finally, ERA researchers conducted a system level assessment to quantify the overall integrated vehicle performance of the HWB against ERA project goals. Vehicle system level assessment metrics for ERA Phase 2 called for simultaneously meeting mission fuel burn reduction of 50%, cumulative community noise levels of 42 at B below stage 4 and 70% lower engine NOx emissions to validate technology maturation of the overall HWB aircraft performance. To meet these goals, Boeing refined the PSC configuration as new data became available throughout the ERA project. Design modifications included changing the wing position, 
adjusting the engine cycle, and altering the plan form shape and the overall size of the airframe. Additional high-fidelity analysis resulted in further refinements to the aerodynamic lines of the nacelles, wing, body, and control surfaces. Designers used results from wind tunnel tests and CFD modeling to update the configuration, making design trade-offs between noise reduction and fuel burn reduction where necessary. All wind tunnel data were based on a design configuration designated ERA 0009 GM, the outer mold lines of which had been frozen in the first year of the project in order to fabricate hardware for the 5.75% geometrically scaled model in time to meet testing milestones. 58 The updated configuration used for the system level assessment, dubbed ERA 0000H1, incorporated fuselage shaping for transonic performance improvements. The key difference between the ERA 0009 GM and ERA 0009 H1 configurations involved fuselage shaping around the engine nacelles, which designers did not expect to affect the aircraft's subsonic performance characteristics. For purposes of this assessment, the ERA 0009 H1 was assumed to be equipped with Pratt and Whitney GTF engines. Changes to the PSC configuration resulted in the ERA 0009H1 achieving a fuel burn level greater than 53% better than the reference configuration. Additionally, assessment of the ERA 0009H1 predicted a 1.8% lower fuel burn than the original PSC, due primarily to a 5% increase in initial cruise LD. An assessment of predicted noise levels for the updated PSC configuration, equipped with aerodynamic landing gear fairings and noise-reducing nozzle technologies, Produced a cumulative margin of 37 if B below stage 4.59 we see a strong te technical path to meeting the minus 42 decibels goal, said Russ Thomas, HWB community noise team leader. It's the last 10 decibels that's really tough. 60. Chapter 7 ERA on the Boeing 757 Eco Demonstrator NASA contracted Boeing to test two ERA technologies on the 757 Eco Demonstrator. The first of these focused on active flow control. AFC, to improve airflow over the rudder and maximize its aerodynamic efficiency. Preliminary research indicated that AFC could improve aerodynamic efficiency and potentially allow for the use of smaller vertical tails on future airplanes. NASA also tested non-stick coatings on the 757's right wing to reduce drag from insect residue. This would enable more laminar flow by smoothing the airflow on the surface of the wing. With the exception of Boeing's proprietary technology, all NASA knowledge gained in collaboration with Boeing from Eco Demonstrator research became publicly available to benefit the aviation industry. One both technologies are designed to improve the airflow over the surface and ultimately reduce drag, said Faye Collier. Increased drag means increased fuel consumption time, which results in more pollutants in the atmosphere. To the 757 Eco Demonstrator was a highly modified Boeing airliner that served as a test bed for a variety of technologies. The project was built upon Provios work by Boeing and various government and private partners to accelerate and leverage new technologies to reduce emissions and noise, improve airlines' gate-to-gate -gate efficiency, and help meet other environmental goals. The Eco Demonstrator's origins dated to Boeing's Quiet Technology Demonstrator program. The company worked with Rolls-Royce in 2001 to develop a quieter turbofan engine incorporating sawtooth chevrons on the aft end of the nacelle and exhaust nozzle. Additional testing in 2005 allowed designers to refine the Chevron design and validate an acoustically treated inlet. Boeing applied these technologies to both the 747-8 and 787, providing dramatic noise reduction. 